Hello, and welcome to the Techniques of the Masters video conference series. I'm Debbie Stamp. Today is the second show of the 1989-90 season, but it's the first one from our new set here at the Marketing Education Center in Rochester. We've made some changes in the program format based on your input that you're going to see today. After we meet and talk with Bill Green, we'll introduce a new segment to our show, The Photo News, where we'll update you on what's going on in the world of photography. Then we'll go on a tour of the new archive building at the International Museum of Photography, and you'll get to see some archive treasure that will become a regular feature. And finally, we'll meet and talk with Duane Michaels. One word of advice, to get all this in, we've reduced the question and answer sessions by about five minutes each, so if you want to get your question in, you'd better start early. The numbers to call are being displayed on your screen right now. 1-800-262-3144. Or in Canada and Mexico, you can call us collect at 0-716-724-0100. Our phones today are being manned by students from the Photojournalism and Fine Art Program at Syracuse University. And we also have several of them watching in our studio right now, so we welcome all of you students. When you call in, our operators will ask you for your name and the school you're calling from. Please stay on the line. Your call will be answered in the order it was received as soon as we start our question and answer session. And now, to introduce us to our first master photographer, let's turn to Mike Garn, the producer of the Techniques of the Masters program. Mike? Thanks, Debbie. You know, we try to feature a range of photographers on our shows. And while we've had several photojournalists on, we've never had a photographer from a daily newspaper, one that has to get out and make or take pictures every day. Well, today we have just such a photographer. He's Bill Green from the Boston Globe. Bill first got hooked on photojournalism as a marketing major at the University of Massachusetts. He worked part-time at the Globe after his graduation in 1979. And in 1980, he joined the staff of Massachusetts' largest afternoon newspaper, the Patriot Ledger. In 1985, Bill moved back to the Globe, where he has worked ever since. And during that time, he's won the NPPA Region 1 Photographer of the Year four times and the New England Photographer of the Year five times. In 1988, he won the NPPA, National Press Photographer of the Year Award, for his portfolio of 40 images, which included photographs of Cambodian refugees. We spent a Sunday with Bill this past July, watching as he prepared for and faced the pressure of a deadline and the uncertainty of what the day would bring. Let's join him now. 366 George, George Victor, uh, to the question mark after that, so that may not be the correct place. I've always had a reputation of being a real feature photographer, out looking. I mean, in newspaper terms, people generally, the old school is, it boils down to news, sports, and features. Uh, in the old days, there are guys who would specialize. Someone would be the, the news guy the, with a scanner and the cigar and the hat and hanging out with the cops. You know? Then you had your sports photographer who just did sports. And then there became this whole change, I think 20, 10, 20 years ago, where people wanted and craved and the human interest photos. So my training has always been, I think, in feature photography, but I've also really enjoyed doing all of it. I mean, half the joy of being a, a newspaper photographer is that you go from a fire to a baseball game to a, 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 window, a woman sitting in a window. It's a good old control desk. Let's see what's going on today. We have some uh, things going on in the Charles River Horseshoe Tournament in New Hampshire. Sounds like fun. Uh, Feature, cruiser. Cruiser basically is someone out just looking, you know, driving around with their scanners going, waiting for news. Red Sox, Yankees, golf. Golf's boring. Stay away from golf. Now, how many photographers are usually out on a typical of the day? Oh, anywhere from 10 to 50, 20. Huh. You know, usually there's a handful that are out of town um, or uh, sick. <laughs> so you have quite a few people that oh, you're yeah. covering. Oh, yeah. I always, I always try to have a something going on my own that's on a sign that I just think is going to, you know, I worked for uh, five years at a smaller paper where we had to generate an awful lot of story ideas. I had to fill a picture page every week, self-produced, self-shot, and lay it out myself. So my feeling is I always want a good idea that I'm working on that's going to yield good pictures, even if it isn't a very important story. And that gets you excited, you know, photographically. Even if the... Uh, 
the idea doesn't have a lot of news value, so what? It's going to be fun and keep you going. And also get you out of some of those boring assignments that stick you with otherwise. Yeah. All right, carry on. We hit the road? Yeah, we're out of here. We have a Red Sox game, <clears throat> the Yankees, that'll be good, and a uh, puppeteer convention. When you're driving around like this, what catches your eye? What do you look for? Oh, coffee. <laughs> Oh, I, I'm just looking for something a little bit out of the ordinary um, when, I, when I drive around. Anything that, uh, usually what makes a good picture for me is a little emotion, a little humor. Something that's going to say something. It, if it's absolutely ordinary, it isn't much of a picture. You need to somehow put a slight twist on it. Whether it be through your, uh, how you approach it, you know, with your lenses or lighting. But more importantly, the, uh, the content of what's going on has to, has to be something there. Okay, we Most of the day I really actually spend around doing just what we're doing now, driving around between assignments looking for things. If I see something, I'll jump out of the car, park. A lot of times I'll get out of my car and just walk for a while. Um, if after a while driving around you don't see anything, it's good just to get out and walk because you're going to see things easier that way. I think a lot of photographers make the mistake of, of barging into something with, I am the photographer, you are the subject and they, you create an us versus them relationship. What I try to do always is get together with a person as human beings simply and, and try to become friendly, get to know them and with the approach of, oh, by the way, I should take your picture because I'm a photographer. And I think you can get much more revealing. I mean, a true, truly good picture shows, reveals something of a person's character. It shows that, that moment that is just awfully hard to, to get if you are putting them at an arm's distance. Here we go. How you doing? Yeah, don't worry. Oh, this is good. I think a photographer needs to um, be extremely aggressive and yet sensitive at the same time. I think it's, it's a real tightrope you have to walk. Um, you have to be aggressive and, and, and perseverance. I mean, you really have to all the time be pushing. At the same time, you have to uh, be sensitive enough, I think, to know people's feelings when, not, when you're pushing too hard. If I get all my IDs on paper. <laughs> How are you? For the Boston Globe. What's your name, yeah? No, I'll have his name on it. Just send it to Pastor. Oh, no, no, I gotta get you a name too, though. All right, Lena, that. Mendez. M-E-N-D-E-Z, yeah. Super. So, what are you doing in the window? I'm sightseeing. Just sight taking in a day, huh? Yeah, me and Pancho have all kind of pictures taken. People oh. go by, take it's a great picture. day for it. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot. Maybe I'll take a few more of you, all right? Whenever you want. I'm going in now. You want me in now? Can I just take a few more shots before you go in? Don't, don't do anything different. Just the way you were. That was great. The moment's lost. <laughs> you're staring right at me. This is the problem once you identify yourself. Sometimes you just have to shoot when you see it. So look at her, she's stiff as a board now. Take a few to be polite. Ah, oh, it's over. <laughs> I think a lot of people starting out in this business get overly concerned with, oh, do I have the right lens? Should I, when I first started in, in a college, I was, I wanted to get two lenses because everyone said, don't buy a 50 millimeter lens, it's stupid. I, that made sense to me, it's a boring lens. So I agonized, 35, 85, 24, 85. And someone came to me uh, and he said, it's not important. And I just couldn't get it through my head. I thought there was a perfect answer. This is the perfect setup, but there isn't. Ultimately, there's no answers. Well, I like to keep things pretty simple. I, uh, I always have two motorized uh, cameras. 18 millimeter lens I use a lot. It's, uh, very wide, I know, and a lot of people, I, I just really like that you, what you can do. You can play a lot of games with it. Foreground, background, framing things. 24, I use the 24 standard a lot, although 18, I tend to use more than the 24. 50, I don't use that much, but I, I've got a 50 macro because a lot of time we need to copy pictures, or if you want a detailed shot, you know, it's, it's a great lens to use, although I don't use it as much as the other ones. 85 millimeter and a 180. And I always have a long lens in my trunk. I don't usually carry it with me. 
But if there's a news story of a boat sinking or if there's a drowning or someone jump, jump off a building or even for feature stuff, it's nice to have a real long lens. Uh, it's really, you know, that shallow depth of field. Always have a flash, a little Vivitar. Um, I don't use a flash much at all. I much prefer available light. You know, this new fast film, you really don't need it that much, but sometimes you have to have it. Um, light meter, which again, for color, you know, we do some color work and chromes, it's much more critical than black and white. For black and white, I really use the metering off my uh, cameras. Flight guide, you know, in case you have to get somewhere in a hurry. Passport, you never know if you're going to be uh, near the airport and there's gonna, something's going to happen somewhere. You got to get out in a hurry, you just go. As far as film, I use pretty much we use uh, Tri-X. I use Tri-X for uh, bread and butter all the time. If I can't get away with 400 ASA, I switched over to T-Max 400 and uh, pushed that to uh, 1600. Uh, which I think is great quality, as good as the Tri-X of 400. And then when it, all else fails and you're starting to shoot in the dark, that's when I bring out the, 32, the new 3200 film, um, which we at the Globe, a lot of us really love it. It's great stuff, and we'll push this as far as we have to, but usually you don't need too much further than uh, 6400. Bill Green, Boston Globe. Thank you. Well, the great thing about sports to me is it's totally hands-off. You can't set it up. You can't manipulate it. There's still that excitement. You come back to the dark room. If I had, geez, did I get it, you know? You wait for the shot, theoretically, shoot it, and then let the motor drive continue in case something happens afterwards. But in reality, I mean, if some guy's barreling into second and they see the ball's coming, you'll just let it rip for that moment. But it's not an excuse. It won't get you a good picture, I mean, unless you're prepared and ready. Someone's going to town here, huh? Yeah. Maddie Wing's going uh, nuts. <laughs> I'm sure they're plotting for you, Bill. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm not that good with that big a head. What's your favorite sport to shoot? I like basketball a lot. I mean, that's probably my favorite sport in general. Celtics, you know, basketball. Um, hockey, I probably like the least. Some of the real offbeat sports are the most fun to shoot for me. You know, if you've got the windsurfing, rock climbing, uh, polo, rugby. Rugby's a great game to shoot. No masks, you can still see those faces, you know. Football's tough because everyone's wearing a helmet and you can't see, their, see them. But I like a lot of little small time stuff that you can get in close still, you know. Baseball's fun, but it's, it's not an easy sport to shoot. I'll tell you that. You know, in these lenses, you have about this much depth of field. Um, Baseball is very fast. You can't follow the ball. You have to pre-focus. You have to anticipate where the action is going to be and beat and be ready. So when it happens, you're already there and set up. What kind of tips would you have for students who are first starting out shooting sports? Well, I'd, I'd say uh, try to try to go to different locations. Take chances. Um, don't don't play it safe. Go for broke. You know, use long lenses. Um, try to get in a different situation so that when you get a good shot, no one else is going to have it. I mean, you can still show creativity in, in positioning. The best picture I ever took here, I took a couple years ago, was really a funny moment. Ken Kaiser, the umpire. Uh, a kid jumped over the edge of the backboard there trying to get a foul ball. He fell on his head into the field. Ken Kaiser, the umpire, walks over, picks him up, grabs him from the crotch and the neck, and he takes him, he throws him back in the stance. It's a funny picture. This is my life. Nice to meet you. How you doing? Thank you, thank you. But you've also got that pressure to produce every day. It's not like you can, well, you can come back and say, I didn't find anything, but I take that as sort of a, a, a personal failure. You know, I want to turn in something every day. Let's check out the bongos. Even though that's not puppets. No. You know, some assignments, you just gotta, some of them just, it's just not there. You gotta do the best you can. You gotta pull something out of it. You know, you can't expect them all to be uh, award winners. Come on, lady, get out of the way. Uh, Youngie, there's a, it's, I guess, a plane into a house. All right, why don't we get in the car and I'll do it. No, I'll find out addresses and stuff. Boston Globe. Can I get your name? We're out of here. Um, her name is Spring. Well, I guess there's a plane crash. Uh, I don't know exactly how bad. 
doesn't sound that bad now. It sounds like a plane into the trees, not into a house. There's nothing like a good news event, uh, whatever, a demonstration or a, a major catastrophe. It's, as we say in the business, we don't wish them to happen. We just wish to be there when they do happen. Is there a problem going in and taking a few pictures from the Boston Globe? No, we can't go in there yet. Can't go in? No. The picture's not always obvious. You know, a lot of people, oh, plane right. crash, we can not get the picture of the plane, so forget it, goodbye, we leave. You see this guy on the roof with the binoculars? It's sort of a, you know, it's an offbeat way of, of saying it, you know, a plane crashed. Bill Green, a photo. Hello? Bill, uh, one more, please. Yeah, Billy, uh, on the way in. Okay, Bill, I'll see you when you get in. Thank you very much. I think I've always strived for um, graphic, uh, strong, simple images. I don't want to, I'm not, I don't think, a very subtle shooter. I like strong, I've always liked a picture that grabbed you by the, by the throat and said, you know, and shook you up a little bit, whether it be happiness, sadness, but some emotion. I like the idea of being able to stir emotion. Now, you've kind of gone into photojournalism. What got you excited about photojournalism? Well, the idea of going to basketball games, concerts, accidents. Um, I mean, you're in the front lines. I just thought there couldn't be a better way to make a living. Early on in this business, it's, it, you can get discouraged, because when you start, a lot of times you're doing the very worst assignments. The new kid, oh, give him this, that, and that, you know? So I've, what I always did want to get myself out of that, you know, problem, I mean, you can just get down. I would create my own ideas that I thought were good that weren't being covered. And I would just go enterprise, shoot them, and turn them in. And I found that editors liked them, and they wanted to run them. So that's the way to keep yourself going in the bad times. We did a story uh, a couple years ago, the Boston Globe, of refugees around the world, and sent five photographers around all these different refugee camps. My, my portion of it was Thailand, the Cambodian refugees. It was tough, I mean, you know, especially now being a father and seeing these kids, you know, really sick. I mean, it, it's not easy. It stays with you. Um, but in the end, I think in general, after a while, it's like anything else. You, it's not that you'd become cold, but you develop a thick skin by doing something so much. I'm working on a project now with a reporter on uh, migrant workers coming up the East Coast stream. They start in Florida and they move all the way up to New York. And we're trying to document the, the families that are dying out on the migrant stream. Many of these families are being replaced by singles that are single men that are easier to manipulate and uh, exploit. Well, there's the picture. What tells you that? It's, uh, it's a little different than the other ones. There might be just a little movement in that picture. She's turning her head side to side. But I think it'll be okay. Well, we'll see. I think it'll be fine. But it's the best moment of all the <clears throat> pictures here. She's looking to one side, the dog's looking to the other side. A lot of people, when they start, they get so hung up on quality, they don't realize that once it gets in the newspaper, it's, it's the moment counts 10 times more than the quality of the image, you know? All that stuff goes out the window when after through newspaper reproduction. You shouldn't get too hung up on that. Getting the picture is much more important. Now, the little kids reaching for an autograph sometimes can be pretty emotional stuff. Not to you or me, maybe, but to them, it's big time. The lady on stilts was pretty good because she was a little different. And the guy, you know, her juxtaposed against the little guy playing the, the uh, guitar. Kind of a good moment, but not what I'd call. I mean, it's fine. It'll be a good, solid picture for the newspaper, but you know, nothing you're really terribly excited about. We don't waste time with contact sheets here because it's just, it's uh, too time consuming. Contact sheets can lie. When you look at them, they may look great, but you can't really tell if it's in focus. If you look at a loop right through to the negative, you know immediately. Now, plane crash. And what happened at the plane crash? Plane crash was a dud, but I got the picture of this man standing on his on his roof with binoculars, which is a little different. So they may run it, probably not. But um, so it was a different way of illustrating that story. That's it. Now we go make prints. Okay.
I think a lot of it boils down to just hard work. Um, it's such a competitive field, it's almost survival of the fittest. Whoever works the hardest, assuming you have an eye, the more pictures you turn in a day, the better you're going to be. It's just a matter of, of uh, experience and hard work. To me, that dynamic of turning something in and it either goes in the paper the next day or it doesn't, you know whether you, in the bottom line, you succeeded or you failed. Another day, and that's a cold way to look at it. But uh, there's nothing like, uh, you know, it's going out and doing it. Mr. Brett. OK, sir. Fenway feature. Um, Fenway feature is this going to sports? I guess, yeah, if they, they need it. Were they looking for that? For no, no, okay. I was just shooting it. So. Okay. Uh, puppets, uh, oh, puppet. weather feature, and that's from the plane crash up in uh, Beverly. I figured no one was injured, so. All right. All with it. Excellent. Thank you very much. All right. What is the one most important piece of advice you'd give to student photographers? Don't become a photojournalist. No. <laughs> if I had to give a piece of advice to a young photojournalist, I'd say work, work, work. We've yeah, had many interns at several dog. papers I've worked, and I've always been amazed at how some of them kind of will waltz in. Here I am. I went to school at blah, blah, blah. Right. And what's, what's you sort of look at this kid like, well, where did this guy come from? Or this woman. I, I think you, you, you got to try to stay humble. Every year, I, go, I become more humble because I realize how much more I don't know. I just work as hard as you can and, and shoot. Make a goal for yourself. You're going to turn in five unassigned pictures a day. And if you don't do that, feel like you failed. <laughs> if you can't do that, OK, make it three. But force yourself to, to, to just go through film. Most papers are going to give it to you for free anyways, and that's the fastest way to learn. <laughs>
where would you draw the line as far as trying to get what you want? Well, everyone, you have to really, uh, everyone has their own line they will draw. Um, there's a big gray area, the way I look at it. And, and some people will come out and, I mean, God knows people, the old history of dragging a, a baby uh, stuffed animal out of their trunk at a fire and throwing it in the, and shooting it. And other people will never touch anything. Um, I'm sort of in the middle somewhere. I, I don't like to set up anything. Um, I think I set up things earlier in my career, and looking back on it now, the more you set up, I mean, the truly good pictures are the ones you never touch. It, the moment's too good. You couldn't think of a, a picture that would be that spontaneous. So I, I really try to avoid setting up anything. Uh, you know, where do you draw the line? You take a picture of a, a woman in her house, and she makes dresses. You know, obviously, you're going to direct her over to a dress and have her do something with a dress. So, you know, I have no problem with that, but it is. It's a series of gray area. Good, good. Thank you. Okay, our next caller on the, on the line is Rodney Roberts, and he's calling from Tallahassee, Florida. Rodney, go ahead. Hello, Rodney. Yes. Okay, what's your question? Okay, my question is, um, how do you um, handle a situation um, when you meet resistance uh, when photographing a subject? Well, it depends on the news value, I guess, of this story. Um, if it's an important story, you, you shoot anyways. It, technically, you have the right to take a photo of anyone in public property. Uh, if it's a, a serious car accident or someone's jumping out a window or whatever, or if the picture means that much to you, I go ahead and shoot it. If it's a very sensitive situation where you really feel you're intruding, I lay back. And it, it's, it's something you can't really, it's not a black and white issue. It, Many times, most picture papers won't run very insensitive, intruding photos. So, but generally, the, your feeling on the street is shoot it and worry about editing it later. Okay. All Thank right. you. Thank you, Rodney. I understand we got lots of people calling in, so we'll go right ahead to our next one to John Conrad in Commerce, Texas. Hello, John. Yes. And what's your question for Bill? Uh, my question is, uh, what kind of developer does he use? And uh, Specifically, uh, does he use AccuFine, and what is his temperature and his agita agitation? At, at the Globe, we use uh, Wing Lynch machines, and we use uh, Tmax developer. Um, depending on the, the ASA speed of your film, it can be anywhere from four and a half minutes to 12, 15 minutes. Okay. You use, uh, have you used AccuFine at all? Used to, yeah, but the new Tmax uh, developer we find is better. Is it tighter grain? Yes. All right. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thank you, John. And our next caller comes from Ogden, Utah. It's Quinn Jacobson. Quinn? Yes. Hello. How you doing, Bill? Good, Quinn. How you doing? Great. Thanks. Uh, I, I I got a question. Uh, I'd like to know how you feel about uh, fine art photography and abstract type photography opposed to your photojournalism. You're doing great, strong stuff, and I love it. But I'd, I'd like to know how you feel about the uh, fine art and, and uh, the abstract end of photography. That's a good one for you. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's great. Uh, I love it. I enjoy admiring it. I know very little about it, and it's not for me. But that's what makes photography so great: is the medium can, you know, accommodate many different types of uh, photographers. I, I don't enjoy shooting it. I have no interest in it, but I do admire the people that can do it well. Great. I appreciate that. No problem. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you for calling in, Quinn. And our next caller is Doug Sperling from Cocoa, Florida. Doug, go ahead. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Um, Bill, obviously you have experience working with the Globe uh, photographically, but my question was uh, how much uh, print journalism experience did you have with writing and, and whatnot? Before I went to the Globe, how much experience did I have? Yes, uh, in print journalism. Uh, five years. I worked at a daily newspaper, the uh, largest daily in, in uh, Massachusetts for five years. Uh, another question would be if uh, someone like me would want to get uh, overseas photojournalism work, uh, how would one go about doing that? Uh, go over and do it. <laughs> 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 it's tough. It's tough to get a, I mean, there's a lot of very established pros that have a hard time getting advances to do that kind of work. I, I would suggest you don't, everyone believes you need to go somewhere a million miles away. At this stage of the game, everything's been done. Often the most, the best story that's overlooked is right in your backyard that no one's doing because it's too obvious. Any particular uh, favorite place that you have to, to shoot? 
I like it all. I mean, I have no location, no. I mean, I, after I've been in the city for three or four days, I, I'm going bonkers, and I, I like going out to the country. So I, I like the mix. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you. Right, thank you. Our next caller is Eric Wilkins. Eric, go ahead. Yes, Mr. Green. Yes, Eric. Uh, do you have any uh, influence over what photos get printed? Yes. Uh, generally speaking, I, I think we are very similar to most newspapers. When you come back from the day shoot, you develop your film, you look at it, you edit it, and you print it. If you can't print it, a lab person prints it. Um, unless there's a problem with your edit, unless someone is upset that, geez, what did you get this, didn't you get that, I'd say 80 to 90 percent of the time, what you edit goes in the paper. I say one more question. Are there any photos you refuse to photograph? Oh, that's a tough one. I, very sensitive situations where I, I just um, turned off. I mean, whether it's a death or um, or a funeral situations where you're just you're looking, you're, you're really connecting as a person, and you just you feel like a total jerk if you're shot. I, I will refuse to shoot that. Yes. Okay. Thanks a lot. No problem. All right, thank you very much, Eric. I understand all our lines are filling up, so if you're not getting quite through, keep trying. We're going to try and get to as many calls as we can. So let's go right away to Montclair, California. Cesar Rodriguez. Cesar? Yes. What's um, your question? Um, hello? Hello. hello. Uh, Mr. Green. Yes. Bill. Um, I'd like to ask... Uh, <clears throat> uh, what what do you do um, on a single day's assignment? Um, how do you figure out what you're going to be working on? Uh, well, most newspapers, when you come in, including my own, I've, you're told what you're working on. You're given a few assignments. And usually you have some t extra time. You know, they try to group your assignments two or three, let's say, in the morning, and then give you a few hours so that a photographer is able to go out and, and pursue something he, might, he or she may be working on. So generally you're told what to do and you're also given some flexibility to make your own assignments. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Green. Thank you. Thank you, Caesar. All right, and now off to Jonesboro, Arkansas, and David Lawrence. David, go ahead. Hi, how you doing? Uh, when you were out covering that plane crash, you identified yourself as a member of the media, and he refused to let you in. Is that a common occurrence when you're out doing news stories? Yes, it is. Uh, you learn quickly not to, usually not to identify yourself. The problem with this plane crash, there was no back door to sneak in. So you had to confront the officer because it was in heavy woods, and they had it all roped off. But in a big story, you, you're more concerned. You've, you've been trained to get the picture. And you, you, you're not going to ask a cop who's going to say no. I mean. You're going to see him turning away other photographers, and you're going to go around the other way, and you're going to try to make the picture. It's not like you're doing anything. I mean, he's under orders to say no. You're not going to do any harm by getting the picture. You're just trying to get the best picture you can. But that is free, you know, that happens frequently. Okay, thanks a lot. All right. Thank you, David. And now to a real interesting place, Spearfish, South Dakota. I think there's a dean out there named Richard Boyd that uh, may be getting our call into us. But our caller right now is John Walsh. Uh, John, go ahead. Yeah, Bill, I have a question for you about editorial control, and it's kind of a follow-up to Eric's. You obviously have a lot of control uh, at the Globe. Did you always have that? And if not, how did you go about getting it? I, I even at the small papers, oftentimes you have more control the smaller paper. Um, and I've papers I've worked at. We've only worked really at two. I've always had a lot of control. I think. If you're at a paper that you don't have a lot of control, you can change that by, by winning over their, their respect for you. I mean, get involved. Get out in the newsroom. Don't hang back in the photo department and just turn your pictures in. If you believe strongly in a picture, go out and fight and, and explain why. If they're right or you, they can convince you you're right, you've learned something. Did you have a lot of those fights early on? Oh, yeah. I still have those fights. Uh, but that's what makes it fun. U usually, uh, you know, it, it, it works out. Okay, thank you. All right, good question, John. All right, and now to Lafayette, Indiana, and Steve Clark. Steve, hello. Yeah. Uh, we were wondering, I, I'm here with a photo class, and we were wondering if you used any different format camera. I uh, never have, not once. Never have? No. All right, well, thanks. Okay. <laughs> All right, glad we could take care of that for you, Steve. That was easy. <laughs> you, you never worked with other formats? No, no. Have you thought of that? Or? I've thought of it, but I've been so wrapped up in what I do. It's, it's 
when I get a day off, the last thing I want to do is take a picture. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go to Muncie, Indiana, and David Laporis. David? Yes. Go, go ahead. Mr. Green, I have a question uh, as far as uh, do you try to disassociate yourself uh, and your photography from your private life? Yes. I don't try, but I've always been the type that had a lot of interest growing up. I, I enjoy doing a lot of different things. So when I get home from work, I'm like a million other people. I just say, geez, I want to go fishing or I want to go hiking or I'm gonna go rush to my softball game. I got, you know, two kids and I've, I've got a wife. So my free time is, believe me, filled up. Um, I don't take even that many. I've been getting help from my wife. I haven't taken any pictures of the kids lately, so I've got to try to work on that now. I see. I'm also curious on how you uh, handle burnout. Burnout? I, I find myself, I go through cycles. Um, I don't never really been through a prolonged period of burnout, but it, there are times that are just down. I mean, you, you may not be finding anything. Nothing may be working for you. You'll go through weeks where you're just not seeing anything. And then other times, uh, you just everything is going great. But what I try to do is I keep lists and lists and always looking through magazines, uh, Newswire, AP, uh, papers, finding ideas that I can be, that are stimulating. So if I'm not getting great assignments or if things aren't going well for me, I can fall back on that and go shoot something that's going to yield me some good pictures and get me fired up again. Oh, I see. Well, I appreciate it very much. No problem. All right. Thanks, David. And now, a little bit out of the country, let's go to Toronto and Mike McManus. Mike? Yes. Yeah. Bill, is, Bill the, uh, your, your, your career seems quite physical, and I'm wondering if it's a young man's game. Can you see yourself in it 15 years from now? I, I can definitely see myself in it. Um, you don't, it, it can be physical, but I mean, if you also learn to scale back. You don't need to carry all the big equipment. You know, you could wear a vest, you could wear one camera and two lenses, and you could do just as good a job. Um, experience teaches you a lot, I think, and there's other ways around it. Good. One second quick question. I'm wondering that if you ever wish you could do the story rather than just the picture. Sometimes, lately a little bit, yes, but usually no. I, it takes too much time and, I, and I, my spelling's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, though. Thank you, Mike, for your call. Now let's go to our studio audience where we have another question uh, from our students from Syracuse. Hi, I'm Aaron Goodman from Syracuse University, the Newhouse School. My question is, does it worry you all the new um, Cytex technology that's coming out, you know, for altering photographs? Does that worry you in the newspaper at all? That worries me a lot. Um, it's scary because editors who are totally illiterate visually can create situations. Um, another thing that worries me is color coming into many newspapers. Uh, top editors picking pictures on color content um, rather than content, you know, editorial content. What we do at, at the Globe is our boss, uh, Vin Albiso, has been great really pushing to bring in the picture in black and white, make a panel of it if it's going to run in color, and fight for the content of the photo. Oh, no, yeah, by the way, it's color. But let's not judge it on color content. Let's judge it for editorial content. Great, thanks. Hmm. Interesting approach. All right, our next caller is from San Angelo, Texas. It's Andrew Madgens. Andrew? Welcome to Techniques of the Masters. What's your question? Um, I was wondering how we uh, got on the paper, how I got a job. Well, a little bit of luck and a lot of uh, pushing. I, a friend of mine, when I was in college, got the internship at the Globe. I uh, couldn't get a job anywhere. I applied to every daily in New England, no luck. So I had a day job, and at nights I went in with him and just, just hung out and became a fixture there and started going in with prints you know, on my own time. And finally they said, Jesus, can't get rid of this guy. We better give him a part-time job. So I was working two, three nights a week. And I was in there every day. The union was getting really upset, you know. And so finally, I, you know, just pushing and shoving. And once you get a foot in the door, you just got to keep, you know, as, as unaggressively as possible in one way. You have to be aggressive and, and just, you know, let them know you really want it. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. Thank you very much for your call. And now let's go to California for Oz Trad in Alta Loma, California. Go ahead. Yes, this is a morality question. Uh, hey, Oz. <laughs> when, uh, when do you need to put your camera down and become involved in a situation when uh, a loss of life or severe injury may occur? 
when the need arises as a human being to do something like that. I've never really experienced it. Um, you know, you see these stories in the highway accidents. You're the first on the scene, and there's a kid, you know, in the car and is bursting of flames. Obviously, I think I would hope anyone would reach in and save the kid. Uh, the harder assignments are like these foreign assignments where you're just walking through misery. And you, you I mean, I did a story in Haiti and uh, these missionaries that go down, and for the first day, it was, you know, I couldn't take a picture. I mean, these kids were climbing up on you, and you wanted to hold them, you were crying. I mean, it was, it was horrible. Um, but then after a while, you realize that, geez, you know, maybe I, if I take some pictures, it may do some good. It, that, again, may be the age-old lie, thinking that you're going to change the world. But ultimately, that's what you're there for. But in, a, in an emergency situ situation, definitely, I mean, I think just as a human being, you'd want to help. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oz, for your call. And now this will be our last call for all you people who tried to get in and didn't make it. We've got another segment coming up with Dwayne Michaels. <coughs> and uh, keep trying on that one. Our last caller is going to be James Collier from New York City, New York. James, go ahead. Hello, Bill. Hi, James. Hello. I'd like to find out if there are times when you may need some type of release from the subjects that you photograph, and also whether uh, you're considering in the future still video image making. Well, I, if I understand what you mean by still video, yeah, I, I think many newspapers are going that way. That's probably years down the road. Uh, taking pictures on tape rather than film. Um, I don't, I kind of was sentimental. I like the, the, the film idea of making a print and, and having the negative. As far as aggressions, I don't have a dog, so I can't beat him up, so. But no, I, I'm pretty, uh, I'm all right. <laughs> I think you're pretty friendly, guy. <laughs> Okay, Jim, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. All right, thank you for calling in. Thanks to all of our callers and our student audience here that ask questions. That's all the time we've got for that. Thanks to you, Bill. Thank you, Mike. Glad to have you here. It's been fun. Thanks okay. a lot. Thanks. And now I'll hand you over to Debbie for a new segment. That went much too quickly. <laughs> it was a great, great segment. Thanks a lot. And uh, welcome to our photo news segment. In this part of the show, we'll keep you informed with news of photographic events, as well as some informative interviews and features. Let's look first at events. This past summer, from August 13th to the 19th, the Fourth, Annu or Fourth International Photography Congress was held in Rockport, Maine. The theme was Photography as an Instrument for Change. We Can Make a Difference. And the guest of honor was Mary Ellen Mark. Participants had a chance to rub shoulders and talk with luminaries such as William Albert Allard, Jody Cobb, Arnold Newman, and Joyce Tennyson, plus an assortment of picture editors, stock agents, photo organization presidents, gallery owners, educators, and critics. Once again, the Congress affirmed its position as the premier gathering for photographic discussion, networking, and just having an all-round good time. Coming up in the next year will be the third biennial PhotoFest 90, set to open February 10th in Houston, Texas. This month-long gala of events will feature more than 80 photographic exhibitions and more than 200 of photography's most creative minds. On the next Techniques program, we will be talking with Fred Baldwin, Executive Director of PhotoFest, for an on-the-scene report. Of the many gallery openings around the country, two were of special note in September. On the 13th, the International Center of Photography celebrated the opening of its new Midtown Gallery. The 16,000 square foot gallery space is located at 1133 Avenue of the Americas at 43rd Street. It will provide a much needed display area for ICP, which had lost its previous space. Scheduled for display from November 5th through January 7th, 1990, will be the work of Magnum founders Robert Kappa, Henri Cartier-Bresson, David Seymour, or Chim, and George Roger. On September 17th in San Francisco, the Ansel Adams Center was officially opened by the Friends of Photography. A museum dedicated to creative photography, the center includes a bookstore, library, and five exhibition galleries, one of which is devoted exclusively to the works of Ansel Adams. The center also will be the permanent home of the Friends of Photography, an organization founded in 1967 by a nationally recognized group of photographers, educators, and historians, among them Adams, Wim Bullock, Brett Weston, and Beaumont and Nancy Newhall. 
scheduled to open on December 15th at Walt Disney's Epcot Center in Orlando, Florida, is the Professional Photographers Showcase, Imageway of the World's Greatest Photographers. The display contains portrait, commercial, photojournalism, industrial, and environmental photography by 21 top professional photographers. And also, we want to take a, a special time right now to let you know that the Spectrum Gallery at Light Impressions here in Rochester, New York, will be presenting the work of Duane Michaels with an opening tonight. Turning now to books, we'd like to recognize two recent publications. The first is Douglas Kirkland's Light Years, Three Decades Photographing Among the Stars. Kirkland, currently with the Sigma Photo Agency, once was a staff photographer for Look Magazine and later was under contract to Life Magazine. This book contains more than 100 images and is a retrospective of his work in the celebrity photography arena. Also appearing on photography bookshelves will be Magnum member James Natchway's Deeds of War. The large format book contains 75 color photographs taken between 1981 and 1989. These come from Natchway's assignments in strife-ridden countries and regions that include Nicaragua, El Salvador, Lebanon, the West Bank and Sinai, Afghanistan, and Northern Ireland. Many of them have appeared in such publications as Time, Life, and National Geographic magazines. Both books are published by Thames and Hudson and will be available in bookstores throughout the United States, Canada, and Great Britain. Now, you know, impact in a photograph is an important element in its success. Just as Natchway's images take us into a conflict and confront us with the situation, the work of Peter B. Kaplan raises us to new heights in the appreciation of photography as well. His photographs of the Golden Gate Bridge and the Statue of Liberty reveal new vistas of these national treasures. Obsessed with heights, his images of the Empire State Building can be seen in a book entitled High on New York. In 1985, he was even married on a ledge at the top of this famous structure. We talked with Peter last year at the International Photography Congress, and here's what he had to say. Everyone's familiar with your photographs, so Peter, because you take photographs from high places, dramatic photographs of the Statue of Liberty, the top of the Golden Gate Bridge, and so forth. Uh, how did you get started that kind of photography? Actually, it goes back to back to 74 when they finished the World Trade Center. And uh, like, like all photographers, I was fascinated by this new high structure and I was walking around down at the base looking straight up at it. And, uh, uh, and I thought, what would it look like from above? And I called up the PR people, got, got my permissions to go up there and because uh, I wanted to do a shot straight down. and. Uh, um, and I went up there, and, and the roof of the World Trade Center, you can't look straight down the edge, at the edge of it, because there's a, a slanted area. At the time when I went up there, that slanted area wasn't covered like it is now. So I said to the PR guy, can I climb down there? And he said, I wouldn't if I was you. And I proceeded immediately to climb down, because uh, I had no fear of, that, uh, of the height or anything else up there. And I was shooting straight down, and if you shoot straight down a, a side of a, well, if you look straight down over the edge of this, you, and, and just looking straight down, you're not going to see the height, not until you get your head away from your subject. So when I was looking over the side of the World Trade Center, I, I just didn't feel the depth that I really wanted to get. And I had a tripod with me. I took my camera, stuck it out over the edge of the building. I had a remote cord, and I fired it. Uh, a roll off. When I got back to my studio a couple of days later with the film and I was editing it, my ex-wife was there and uh, she was looking at it and uh, when she saw these photographs, with, which were my first what I call pole photograph, she immediately, she had acrophobia, she got up and I don't want to say on TV what she said, but uh, she walked out of the room and uh, told me I was totally out of my thank you mind. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, and I realized that I had created something, uh, a reaction out of a person to a photograph that was really stupendous. And I feel that any good photograph or art form should create a reaction. 
then I got the opportunity to get into work on the Statue of Liberty program. And uh, uh, I volunteered for that project and uh, ended up working now. It's been uh, six years that I've been working for the foundation as a volunteer, documenting not only the statue, but the Ellis Island part of the project. Uh, I work according to, to weather, and I want my assistant there. I'm not going to go ahead and say, well, you, it's Sunday, you've got to have the day off, so I'll go climb by myself. And if it's going to be a good Sunday, I'll say we're going to climb at sunrise, or we'll go out camping at the Statue of Liberty, do a sunset at the, up in the torch, and then wake up uh, and do night shots, and then wake up and do a sunrise out of the torch. Uh, and this could happen on a Saturday night and Sunday morning. I remember one assistant, Laura, said to me, uh, uh, when I called her up on a Saturday morning, because it was snowing like mad, she said, oh, I thought we weren't going to, for sure we weren't going to work today. And I said, Laura, snow is the best, one of the most beautiful conditions that you can get. And we went out to the statue and we were climbing all over the statue and we created some beautiful, beautiful images that day. You know, so I did find myself a little niche that I didn't even realize. It was just something that I really loved doing. And uh, I think that's what photography is about, going out and creating images that you want to do that you enjoy doing, and if you can get paid extra, that's the bonus. You're frequently seen with your uh, pet parrot there. What's his yeah. name? Kasuku, K-A-S-U-K-U. It's a Swahili word meaning parrot. Do you have any problem getting through customs? Uh, not, well, getting back into the States, I one time had trouble, but one time I was uh, coming into Canada, and the first time he went across the border, and uh, uh, I was going into Canada and uh, this up into the Montreal area and this uh, customs woman uh, came over well, the, I went through the first customs check and they said uh, you got a bird bring it over there and I went over and this woman came out and she said excuse me monsieur she said uh, what type of bird is that and I picked him up at the time and I said he's not a bird he's a pussy cat are you a pussy cat and she said, Monsieur, you wait here. And she walked back into the uh, customs office, and she walked out about two minutes later with about three or four other customs people. And she says, Monsieur, she says, uh, make the uh, bird meow. I said, Madame. I said, only cats meow. <laughs> and she stood there with this stupid-looking face and uh, didn't know what to say. And, uh, and I finally made a meow. And then she said, all right, go ahead. And they, I went across the border. So he's never had any problems. but. Except one, one guy out in Montana one time tried to give us a rough time getting him back in, but we got him back in. Great, great. All I can say is a very interesting gentleman, and he has a, a, a way of making you feel about 100 feet tall. And now we're going to go on to some product news. On June 19th, Eastman Kodak Company unveiled the Kodak T-Max 100 direct positive film developing outfit. This new kit allows users to produce black and white transparencies with T-Max 100 professional film or Kodak technical pan film. Kodak datasheet J87 contains exposure and processing recommendations for the new outfit. At the same time, the company announced it will discontinue Kodak Panatomic X film and Kodak Direct Positive film. These films and the current Kodak Direct Positive film developing outfit will be available until supplies are exhausted, approximately at the end of 1989. On October 26, the family of three new Ektacolor professional papers and three new display materials were announced. These new materials are intended for use in Kodak Process RA4. Standing for Rapid Access, Process RA4 develops RA materials in about half the time required to process EP2 materials in EP2 chemistry. The three new Kodak Ektacolor papers, Portra, Supra, and Ultra, are optimized for printing applications within the professional lab. The new display materials include all new Kodak DuraClear RA material, which is clear-based for diffused light source display units. The new RA products have a variety of advantages, Two of the most important are latent image stability for at least 24 hours and greatly improved resistance to pressure and abrasion desensitization. To get additional information on these or other products, you can call the Professional Photography Division's question line at 1-800-242-2424. Or you can write to Ken Lassiter, Professional Photography Division, Eastman Kodak Company, 343 State Street, Rochester, New York, 14650. 
Next, in photo education news, Columbia College in Chicago, Illinois, and Ohio University in Athens, Ohio, have each received a $25,000 endowed scholarship from the Professional Photography Division. The scholarships became effective this September and are part of the Kodak Professional Photography Scholarship Program, which is in its second year of operation. Last year, Brooks Institute in Santa Barbara, California, and the University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri received the endowed scholarships. And finally, some updates and information. For those of you who were with us on our April 6th show this year, you'll be pleased to know that Joyce Tennyson received the coveted ICP Photographer of the Year Award later that same month. The award was presented at a dinner hosted by Cornell Kappa and the International Center of Photography. And next, be sure to mark your calendars for the upcoming master's programs. On February 15th, we'll be bringing you Andreas Hyman and Arnold Newman. And on April 5th, we have Gordon Parks and William S. McIntosh planned to visit with us. We'll be sending out advance information and posters prior to the shows. Now, I'd like to inform you of a change in our mailing list. For the last two years, we have been using the Kodak Photo Educator Newsletter mailing list to distribute our materials. Just this fall, we have established a separate Techniques of the Masters list, which is more current and also smaller. If you are watching this show, have responded to a previous show, or have called the 844 Kodak number, you're probably on this list. To be sure that you aren't left out when we switch lists for the next mailing, please fill out and return the Don't Lose Your Signal card enclosed in the brochure of your last packet. Now I'm going to show that to you now. The card's right in the center. And about those posters, to those of you looking for the secret answer needed to get the J. Maisel poster, guess what? You all passed the test. There really wasn't any special answer. All of the answers, and there were some real good ones, were accepted, and we'll be mailing out the, post, uh, the posters shortly. Now, if you've mistakenly sent in your Michael's Green card for a Maisel poster, relax. We've sent out new cards to anyone who did that. For today's show, so that there is no mistake, the question for number five on your poster reply card is, what photographer would you most like to see as a guest on a future master's program? Write your answer in and send us your card for those premium quality posters. Remember, we have over 2,000 posters to give out, but only the first 200 will be signed. So get your card in early. And now speaking of early, if you tuned in to our test signal time, you saw the video gallery of student work. If you'd like to have your work included in our portfolio for the February 15th program, here's all you have to do. Send your images to Ken Lassiter, Professional Photography Division, Eastman Kodak Company, 343 State Street, Rochester, New York, 14650. All work submitted must be on 35 millimeter slides. We cannot accept prints. Each image should be labeled with your name and the school which you attend. And most importantly, do not send originals. We will not be able to acknowledge receipt of your images, nor will we, will we be returning any of your work. So make sure that you send copy slides, identicals, or duplicates, not originals. This is an excellent way to show your work to the rest of our audience. So let's see some of your best images. And now, let's get on to the next portion of our show with the Professional Photography Division's Photo Educator Manager and our Executive Producer, Ken Lassiter. Ken? Thanks, Debbie. You know, a lot of people, when they think of photography, they think of taking pictures. But the field of photography is really much broader than that. It's the job of the museums to collect photography and photographic equipment and to display these things in a way that explains what they all mean and how our present relates to the past. Today, we're going to take you to the International Museum of Photography at the George Eastman House here in Rochester, New York. Completed this past January, the new archive building has dramatically increased the museum's storage and working space by over 73,000 square feet. We thought you'd like to see the new facility, so we asked Director James Inyot to be our guide. Let's go on a tour. Welcome, Ken. Hi, Jim. How are you? I'm great, thanks. Wow. This is really impressive when you first walk in. Isn't this something? It's known as the Potter Peristyle, and of course, not only serves as the first impression for our museum visitors, but actually provides an introduction to the whole museum complex. 
gives us access uh, to the galleries uh, which are on our right and to a new three-story climate controlled space on the left. Interestingly enough, the whole new building stands on the original spot where George Eastman had his uh, formal gardens and vegetable gardens. It gives us an opportunity to have two of the floors underground that uh, helps us by being underground to preserve the historic site in general, but also offers the opportunity for exceptional uh, efficiency in terms of climate control. So we step over and take a look. The skylight sure let some welcome light in for the staff. I do indeed. As you can see, the uh, light court uh, adjoins uh, all of the office and workspace. Yes, I've heard how the new building offers uh, greatly increased access to the collection and some new galleries, right, Joe? It, it does indeed. In fact, uh, exhibition is the primary means for us sharing our collections. The museum organizes 12 exhibitions a year most of which are accompanied by uh, publications. In addition, we organize a number of traveling exhibitions that go around the world. It was 40 years of collection growth that forced the museum in 1985 to begin a campaign to build a new building. Both the community at large and corporations joined in an effort to bring this facility that you, to a conclusion that you see before you now. It was Kodak who provided the essential endowment to make sure that this museum could operate well into the future. Thank you. Jim, I've heard the George Eastman House described as a collection of collections. What does that mean? Well, it certainly means two things. One is that as a collection of collections, it's one of the most distinguished anywhere in the world. But it's also a collection of many collections. There are over 600,000 prints and negatives in one collection. There are 30,000 volumes of books, including rare books, in our library. Over 8,000 films attended by over 3 million still photographs in the film collection. And of course, over 11,000 pieces of technology and apparatus in our technology collection. Now, each one of these collections could exist on its own and be a museum unto itself. But the fact that they're here all under one roof provides a greater opportunity for interpretation, study, and appreciation by both the public and scholars alike. You know, Ken, under previous circumstances, the uh, collections, print collection, the negatives, the library, all the thousands of objects that that encompasses were together in an attic over the Dryden Theater. In fact, um, that was also where members of the public or scholars went to have access to do research to increase their appreciation of the medium. Sounds very difficult. It didn't take long before the collections overpowered all the other space and research was virtually halted. With this new facility, we not only have expanded opportunities separate from the storage of the collections for people to have access to increase their appreciation, but we have, with 20-foot ceilings, an opportunity for uh, future growth um, over a very long period. Ken, the Gannett uh, Photo Study Center is, is really the, the place in the museum that is devoted to serious research uh, in the collections. And the collections, of course, have enormous strength in uh, not only a wide variety of extremely rare objects, but individual collections in depth, such as Stieglitz, Kazebeer, Hein, and a host of others. It's um, uh, this environment that really makes research possible in a serious way. And I should have mentioned that, of course, there are literally tens of thousands of photographs uh, by commercial photographers and uh, amateurs that also open up the opportunity for a rich cultural resource study. Jim, how many cameras does uh, Eastman House have in the collection? Well, of course, uh, the technology collections represent much more than just cameras. To answer your question, there are 5,500 uh, still and motion picture cameras in the collection of over 11,000 objects. And the, the range of, of the technology is, is, all, is equally uh, enormous. Um, probably the earliest object is an 18th century camera obscura that predates photography itself, right up to and including 
a, a prototype for a lunar orbiter that was uh, made in the mid-60s. And probably the most uh, recent up-to-date acquisition for this collection is a Canon Zapshot, which uh, makes still video images. Your film collection is one area I know very little about. You obviously have a very large collection. Yeah? Well, when you consider, Ken, that this is the second oldest and third largest collection in the world, uh, and that over half of all the films made no longer exist, this collection takes on a uh, unique importance that um, I think can't be denied in terms of the stature of the museum. Uh, to give you an idea of the kinds of things that are here that are so rare, there, it has, the museum has the single largest collection of silent American film that exists. It has um, all of Cecil B. DeMille's silent film collection and all of the MGM collection. It's to the credit of the, the various curators who've been here over the museum's history that they've preserved millions and millions of feet of film that now no longer exists in any other form or any other place. And concurrent with that is a major responsibility as custodians, and that's preservation. Much of the film that has been produced over the history of the medium it was uh, on nitrocellulose-based material, which, as you know, is it's very expl explosive and very fleeting. So there's a very costly and uh, labor-intensive program at the museum to convert all of that film to safety film. Uh, it really is a, an extraordinary collection because it doesn't rest just there. The collection also includes uh, a lot of collateral material, uh, posters, still images, uh, promotional material, uh, all the kind of research uh, material that's needed to truly study the history of film. The Mitchell Research Library here at the museum is one of our most unique collections. It contains over 30,000 volumes in this room where we're standing, 30,000 volumes devoted to historical literature of the medium. Additionally, it has the privilege of, of being able to offer over 400 titles of different subscriptions. I didn't know there were 30,000 books on photography and 400 periodicals. Well, of course, it's a, it's a wide array of things from being very rare objects to mm -hmm. standard optical, chemical, scientific literature in the field. Rare things like the original pencil of nature uh, by Fox Talbot and uh, translations of uh, Daguerre's process as it was announced. It's a reference collection, a research collection, so it has to be able to serve the widest possible public. You know, Ken, cataloging is, is the backbone of any good museum operation because without cataloging, you don't have access to a collection. And this museum has taken a leadership role in developing use of computer and video technology to catalog its collections on video disc. Today we have about 25% of the collection on video disc, but we have 100% of it inventoried, ready and waiting to be put into, put into force. It's uh, on the horizon for museums, probably the most important research tool that's available to us today in terms of making the collections really accessible without impacting or endangering the preservation of the collection. In fact, in regard to that, let's go take a look at the uh, conservation department. Conservation is uh, probably one of the least visible, but one of the most important behind the scene operations within the museum. And the conservation department here at the Eastman House is certainly one of the leading conservation departments, if not one of the few that exist in museums devoted exclusively to photography anywhere in this country. An education department in a museum is really the leading voice in not only outreach for the museum, but for interpreting the collections and the activities, the programs in the museum in the broadest possible way. Our education department also runs an extremely busy program for regional school districts involving uh, classroom ages of four through high school. And there are a number of specific programs devoted just to university students. Jim, that was a great tour. Thanks for showing me around. You bet. It was a pleasure to have you here. What are your future plans now for George Eastman House? 
Well, with the, uh, the broad support that we have in this extraordinary new facility, mm -hmm. it's clear that the uh, immediate mandate is for the Eastman House to take its role uh, as a leader in the field in scholarly research, and at the same time to expand the opportunities for programs that bring the scholar, the general public together in a more equitable environment. And I'll tell you what, if you come back in a year, we'll give you a tour of the restored George Eastman House mansion and formal gardens. That's great. That's a deal and a date. Great. We'll see you. Bye-bye. Well, that certainly was an interesting tour. I'd like to welcome our director of the George Eastman House, Jim Inyot. Thanks for coming, being with us today. Thank you. Pleased to be here. Jim, uh, is it uh, possible for just anyone to visit the George Eastman House and uh, have access to the collections and do some serious research? Anyone who has a love and passion for photography, or fail that, a love and passion for life itself, which is what it's all about, indeed has access to the collections. So it means simply that everyone is treated equitably. Public, students, scholar, professionals, all have uh, different ways and opportunities of, of seeing the original prints according to their needs and desires. There are research facilities, study rooms, uh, reading rooms. Uh, the new facility simply makes uh, access to those collections possible in a variety of ways. Well, I'm sure you'll be hearing from some of our viewers and want to visit the uh, mansion soon and the, the archive building and see it. So, but since you have the mansion, uh, tell me, uh, how's the restoration coming along on the mansion? We're at the point right now where most of the physical construction and reconstruction, the recreation uh, of the mansion as it was in 1905, is just about completed. So between now and the end of the year, we'll be uh, resetting the mansion as it was when George Eastman lived in it with all the artifacts, furniture, uh, and uh, memorabilia that uh, belong to him into the mansion uh, and will be ready for opening on January 20th. Well, I hope you send me an invitation. I will indeed. That's great. Well, thank you for being with us and thank you for taking us on that little video tour and we're looking forward to coming back and showing our viewers the uh, George Eastman House Mansion restored to its finest hour of glory as it was in 1905. One thing we learned in producing this piece, the George Eastman House has a lot of precious gems in their collections. So, with the help of the museum curators, we created a new segment for our master's program, which we call the Archive Treasures. In this first piece, we thought it was fitting to look at the very first commercially produced camera. Phil, please tell us about this camera. Well, when photography graduated from the laboratory to the marketplace in 1839, a camera was made that would make it, was now made it possible for anybody with a little bit of patience uh, to make a photograph. The camera was designed by Louis-Jacques Mondet Daguerre, the gentleman who invented the process, and subsequently manufactured by Alphonse Giroux, out manu manufactured and marketed. And in order to testify to the authenticity of the camera, there was a seal on the camera that bore the signature of both of these gentlemen. The camera was sold as part of a complete system of photography that included a fuming box where fumes from heated mercury would develop the plate, the daguerreotype plate, and there were a box of chemicals with all of the necessary materials for making photographs, as well as the world's first manual describing the photographic process. It was a complete description of the process and the exact steps you had to make in order to take a picture. So now you had a complete system of photography and it was enormously popular, uh, which is uh, because this manual, which appeared in French in 1839, had been translated into at least a dozen languages within a year. I'd like to thank Phil Kondax for his help in preparing this segment, and we'll be bringing you more segments like that in the future. Now let's meet our next master photographer, Duane Michaels. Duane became a commercial photographer in the 1950s, and in the 1960s he was recognized for his fine art photo sequences that took the viewer beyond a single image into the world of metaphor and illusion. Over the years, Duane's success has lasted and his personal work has continued to grow. 
One of the strongest qualities that Duane imparts to young photographers is inspiration. He makes them think about what photography is and why they're taking pictures. To capture some of his motivating presentation, we taped Duane as he critiqued and discussed photography with students from the School of Visual Arts in New York City. Let's join them now. I didn't become a photographer until I was 28. And I had never planned to be a photographer and I never went to photography school. But, you know, I saw my chance that I took it. It's like the Tao, the Chinese idea that one flows with life, that you flow with the events. The ones that get broken are the ones who fight against it. But when you flow with them, but always stay open, open to every experience, because your life is, of course, the sum total of your experiences. And if you have no experience, then what's that amount to? Killer kids are there, the students. What are we going to say? Will they be mean? How can I discourage them? I'll think of something. I'm good at that. To me, the bottom line is, what the hell is this picture about? What is being expressed? I look for humanity in work. I look for, um, I want somebody to tell me what it feels like to be alive. At least it's cold in here. Uh oh, there they are. Killer kids. Some of them actually have fangs. Oh my God. Can I get another crowd? This one looks small. Oh, hello. All work, all good work is demanding. You have to get involved in it. Most people don't want to. You see, what people like about photographs is it's very accessible and very easy. It's not demanding. And that's wrong, because pho photographs, if anything, should be very demanding. You know what's very nice about this? First of all, it's a cliche picture. It's well done, but you know, it's like, give me another old lady, whatever. But what's marvelous about it is that he's extended all the way around it these little frames which seem to be bits and pieces of her life. And which points out the fact to me, which is something I like a lot, is that we are simply not this face. We are three-dimensional, four-dimensional, five-dimensional. We are passionate, we cry. So why is this just, the, like this is an over, this is an easy shot. You, got, you get your hands, you get your gray hair, you get your anguish, you can't beat that. But he has made it much more poignant by giving us more of the facts of her life. There's a presence here. This is a, this is a face and hands. But this is a person. This is, she lives around here. So I think this is very exciting. I'm glad you did it. Yeah. You saved yourself from banality. And, and there's, so all these kids getting out of school want to become Andy Warhol, for God's sakes. Spare me another Andy Warhol. Or uh, uh, somebody like that. Uh, it's the need is not to express oneself. The need to be an artist is not to become rich and famous and have your picture on the cover of interviewer or form. The need is a passion to talk about something about the bug you have up your ass, about something that means something important to you. And eventually, maybe 20 years down the road, it might follow that that stuff ends up being art. Uh, there's something about um, the word Lola. Doesn't that, isn't that sort of spicy, Lola? Mary Ann, Lola. Don't you think, <laughs> don't you think, Lola? Mary Ann, Mary Ann. Oh, she's at church. She went to confession. Lola, she's still in bed. But nobody knows where. <laughs> right. Uh-oh. Is this? Is this the end? Yeah. It's too chic. It, uh, I wish it were a little, um, there's no sand in her navel. First of all, she should be nude. I don't want to see she's wearing that. I'm just telling you, I want, to, I want to spice it up a little. Let's get a 20th opinion. No, let's not. I'm the boss. I'm here to tell This is what I do. You shut up. OK. <laughs> One of the dangers with color, I think, is that people always tend to photograph color. Color is so dazzling that you settle for the color. I don't find color emotional. This is a, probably a cliche. I find black and white emotional. I find color pretty. Beware of pretty and beware of the beautiful. What is this? Tell us what this is. Why did you, why, who's responsible for this? Why did you do this? Or what is this? I mainly photograph children. Okay. And um, um, I went in a box and I photographed them through my legs. You can be arrested in a lot of states for that, you know. I like photographs to be demanding. Only in photography do we expect to go to a, to a photography exhibit and look at all these pictures and you know, oh yes, that's right, that's what trees look like. Oh yes, that's, you know, photography by, essentially by its nature is not demanding enough. We're always responding to it. It's, it gives us so much information. It tells us when to cry and why we're crying. But there are other photographs. Like when you go to, a, when you read a good novel, you see an interesting movie, all good authors make demands on you. It's in the subtlety, art is in subtlety, and subtlety means you have to come to the artist. In photography, most people come to you, you know. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I'm just saying, the problem, I think the most interesting work is in nuance 
and you have to begin to figure it out. You go to him. He doesn't come to you. Otherwise, it ends up all being Walt Disney, which isn't bad either. They're very nicely done. These are beautiful photographs. Thank you. Yeah, you take nice pictures. Uh, of course, I'm not taking anything away from these people, but these people lend themselves to very sympathetic pictures. I would find this much more interesting, personally, if you had not stopped here at this definition of what a portrait of these people is. But uh, I know some people have, have them write about their lives, or I would like to embellish this. I think his story is much more interesting to me than the way he looks. What I would like to see you do is go beyond the definition. Get more intimate, I mean, in the sense that you would not only show me what they look like, and this is impossible, tell me what they feel like. And, that, and so that, to me, the frontier is not to, you know, this, this is a perfect example of this kind of work, which is honorable work. But as a creative person, the question is, well, what do you, where did you go with this? Other than showing what they look like, how do you get inside? How do you, if you have to change the rules, if you've got to write, if you've got to show the picture off, I don't care what you do, that's the, so I'd like you to take it even further. Every piece of art is pretty much of a gimmick. Uh, only in photography is one expected to find, quote, life out there, and it's not supposed to be touched or moved or arranged or, the artist is, I know, the artist is not supposed to intrude into the truth of the moment, which is such bullshit. A good style is simply uh, a, a kind of a decorative coat that the idea wears. You take the coat off, but the idea is still what counts. That doesn't make any sense at all, but something like that. So this girl has a big strawberry in her mouth. That's her tongue, isn't it? Yeah, there's something grotesque about body parts very close up. Even the choicest parts are still kind of grotesque close up like this. Yeah, these are interesting. I love seeing, this is wonderful. I think that's really great. You know, the, 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 the uh, surrealist did a wonderful trick, and this is a very typical surrealist trick, juxtaposing, I love that word, juxtaposing, juxtaposing uh, unfamiliar objects, like putting things together that don't belong together. We think certain things belong together, and if those things are not in that same, we, we live on such a tight little ship in terms of what we think to be reasonable and logical and the way the world should be. If any of those things are completely slightly one inch to the left or slightly one inch to the right, we get very upset by it. And, that's, and this is upsetting in the sense because these things have nothing to do with each other. This is really quite beautiful. I think this is a wonderful photograph. But I'm so excited to see this because fashion photography is mostly constipated. And you know, it's like spinning its wheels over the last, there's no real, Deborah Turberville I think was the last real great new vision in fashion photography. And I love Sheila Metzger's work too, but I think Deborah Turberville is such a strong point of view. That's what I look for in this work. You know, it's like those old posters of Uncle Sam during the Second World War, forget it. But they always had Uncle Sam saying, I want you. Well, that's what I want in this work. I want to see you, you know. And all of this work is a terrific beginning. This is all a point of departure. None of these pictures are a destination. You know, when you look at photographs, ask yourself, what are these photographs really about? What's this really about? You went all the effort to work at night. I would, and this is lovely, you know. But I was particularly fascinated by the detail. And, yeah. And the way that it comes across. Okay, but just remember one thing, all those things like the detail and form and all that, to me those are just ingredients. That's like the ingredient of a sentence. You know, the subject goes first, the verb, whatever, then the object. It's like diagramming a sentence. But when you finish the sentence, there's something there. These are all details about form and stuff, but you know, they're empty, you know. Hello? Nothing falls out. I mean, no, go, go further with it, okay? Boom, boom, boom. Next. Whoa. <laughs> now, what is this technique? Um, mm -hmm. Sandpaper and uh, etching tool, exact mm -hmm. knife. Yeah, these are wonderful. I love, this is beautiful. I've never seen this particular, I've never seen this before, or something just like this. These are very provocative. There are two ways of thinking about photography. One is the purest, and that is that life is there, you document it, you don't intrude. I think that the more the photographer intrudes, even if it only means having the guy move over here or turn his face that way, I think that I think artists intrude, they take charge, and they transform. Now, nothing's much been transformed, not too much intrusion, a lot of recognition. You recognized in this man a certain person who represented what you were trying to talk about, and he's a good example of that particular person. But as a photographer, what you essentially did was to respond to given stimulus. You found this. You didn't invent this. This was something you encountered. And photographic history told you that this is a legitimate picture. And we're all moved by this picture, OK? So I like these because these, these are demanding. That guy, you, you presume a lot about that guy. You think, ah, homeless, alcoholic, 
blah, blah, so young, so, you know. And this one, I don't know what the hell is going on here. I don't presume about this at all. This makes demands on me. So what you've done is picked up that ball and you've run over into the twilight zone, I might add, or else the Roach, Roach Motel. And once you check into that dark room, you never check out. Once I was here at this very school, and a student put his hand up and said to me, well, what if you have a job, but you don't feel like doing it? And I said, do you feel like eating? You know, that students have the luxury of saying, well, I don't, the muses aren't heard, you know, I never get up that early. You know what I mean? It's a matter of uh, doing. Everything's in the doing. You've got two choices, doing and bullshit. Life is so damn interesting. Life is amazing. Life is extraordinary. The very structure of life is never examined by photographers because they're always observing the facts. They're, they observe the bits and pieces, but they don't observe the house it builds. You know what I mean? They're always looking at the parts. What I love is this constant change. And in the change is a challenge. And the challenge always is to, is to investigate and always to be confronted with uh, the new possibilities that life offers you. If you have an inventive mind, and I stress the word mind over the eyes because I never trust the eyes. The eyes don't know anything. The eyes tell, we are so culturally defined. What we tend to see is what John Zarkowski probably told us. It's okay to see or Stieglitz or one of the form, the people who define photography. So I'm much more interested in the mind. And um, if you begin to pay attention to your mind and your own foibles and your own curiosities and your idiosyncrasies, that's where you separate the artists. That's where the separation comes in. When you look at any good photographer's work, what makes it good is you realize that nobody else in the whole world would have taken that particular photograph. It's such a unique sensibility. I'm 57. I can't wait to become 58 to find out what I'm going to learn next year. I mean, I'm, it never comes to an end. Remember that. The growing process never comes to an end. We are always beginners. But the problem is most people don't know that. And they think by the time you're 30, you get your mortgage, and you get your wife, you get your 2.3 kids and all that, and you get your, you know, your IRS, that that's what it's about. It's not what it's about. The trick is that you figure out what it's about for you, you know? Not Ansel Adams, not anybody else, you. Boom, boom, boom. I'm very much interested not only what the world looks like and what the world feels like, but I'm also in the structure of the world. I'm talking about consciousness, and I think consciousness is the bottom line. Plato said the unexamined life isn't worth living, and that's what it is. Read, pay attention for unexamined. So what happens then is that every bit of life becomes curious to me, isn't it? Especially time, like when I say this is, this is so fundamental in my thinking. When I say this is now, it's not now. Watch, I'm going to count to three, and this is the exact moment of being. One, two, three, this is now. Wait a minute, this isn't now because now is now. When I say it's now, it's not now anymore. You can't even say it's now because it's not now. And I was born, I was born now. When I was in high school, it was now. When I was in the army, it was now. And now it's now. And when I die, when, I'm, when am I going to die? I'm going to die now. I'm not going to die tomorrow or yesterday, but the minute you say it's now, it's not now. The whole thing's an illusion. Our lives are constructed a construction of the mind of illusions, a series of illusions. But we're so busy walking on the surface of things that we never really look. It has to do with working very, very hard to stay alive, to, to hold on to your humanity. And that's the bottom line, to stay as vulnerable as you can. And as you get older, it becomes more and more difficult. But in your vulnerability and in your tears and in your anxieties, in that part of your life is where the poetry is and where your own truth is because only you know what that is, and that's the only thing you have to give to me. As artists, the only thing you have to give to me is your own true feelings. And if you don't know what those feelings are, if you're going to be photographing somebody else's feelings all the time, somebody else's life, somebody else's faces, then it's going to have to be secondhand. But the minute you talk about your own truth, as a woman, as a man, as a straight person, as a gay person, wherever you come from, whatever that truth is, that's, that's the bottom line. It's a matter of becoming totally conscious, not only of time and the moment, not in the decisive moment moment, but in the great moment of being. You will never, ever, ever be duplicated in the universe. You're more important than Jesus Christ. You're more important than Ansel Adams. You're more important than Greta Garbo. You are the event which will never be duplicated. And once you come into that consciousness, then everything becomes infinitely special and precious and of if you don't find this life curious, then you are such a product of this culture that you don't know you're even breathing. Ba boom boom. Now we want to welcome Dwayne Michaels to our studio today. Dwayne, we've had a lot of people asking for a long time to bring you on the program, so I think you're making a lot of viewers happy today by being here. Before we go to Dwayne, though, uh, we've got a lot of calls in on our line about the George Eastman House. And let me give you the number of the George Eastman House in Rochester, New York, so you can call them and they can answer your questions about 
uh, visiting there or any other information you want to know. The number is 1-716-271-3361. Number's on the screen now. So call the George Eastman House directly if you have any questions for them. We'll have uh, Professor Inyot on another program in the future next year, and we'll have a question and answer session with him at that time. Let me show you the segment on the restored George Eastman House mansion, okay? Well, uh, Dwayne, we've got lots of calls out there. I, that, the director tells me that the uh, switchboard is lit up with calls. So let's go to our first call, okay? Fine. All right. Uh, the first caller is from Onondaga Community College in Syracuse, New York. It's uh, Victor Lesnicki, who's the uh, director of the photography program there. Victor, are you on the line? Yes, I am, Ken. How are you? Great, thanks, Victor. Uh, Victor, I understand you're having a special event there today. Is that correct? Yes, we invited uh, some of our local high schools uh, over for open day photography. They toured our facility. They had lunch on campus, and we developed some film for them in our photo uh, lab, and uh, the kids are here watching it along with our photo majors. So we made it a recruitment day, an informational day, and a teleconference day. That sounds great. I hope you're enjoying a teleconference. Oh, I think the students are right here. See their outcomes from their reactions right now. That's great. You have a question for Dwayne? Yes, uh, Dwayne. My question is, uh, what experience and education that you had that you think made the most uh, sense to you as a uh, educator even right now? But from the standpoint of what one experience do you think did it for you? Well, there wasn't any one. Ooh, there wasn't any one experience. It was sort of accumulation of everything. Um, I think the best thing to do is just stay alert to everything that happens and pay attention and read a lot. Uh, but there wasn't any really one experience. Sister Mary Eudoxia in the third grade, I think she was the one who had a lot to uh, do with my... You know, I never knew what a Eudoxia was. I'm not answering your question at all, but uh, uh, no, there's no one experience. Well, I guess what you're saying is life is the experience. Then. Yeah, it, but it's really paying attention to life and not just walking through it, but experiencing it. Thank you very much, Victor. Okay, okay thank you, Arnold. Okay, our next call is from Roosevelt High School in Yonkers, New York. We have uh, Channel 19, WDMC TV. They have a brand new satellite dish, and they wrote us a letter that they were uh, having a new program today for the first time and that they would be watching, and uh, said they would call us, and they're on the line. Anne Marie, are you on the line? Yes. Uh, we're here, and we're all uh, very happy to be a part of this new experience, uh, teleconferencing. And uh, we're also happy to meet Dwayne Michael. The students just loved the poster. <laughs> and uh, we really need to ask you, from a photographic and an artistic point of view, I have my fine arts uh, director here, Fred Nold, and we're studying the lighting and how essential the lighting is to that picture. And I know from some reading I've done about Dwayne Michael, he talks a lot about natural lighting and no use of strobe or little use of strobe. And would he comment on that for us, please? <laughs> natural lighting, little use of strobe. Uh, that photograph was taken with available light. That's daylight. And um, if you see in the reflection, you'll see the door was open to let more light come in. But it's really about the, uh, the glasses and the reflection of the glasses, which were exciting. Besides, Sting wouldn't take them off, which made an easy problem to solve. I don't know how to use strobe. I never use strobe. I use uh, daylight 75% um, of the time. And when I need lights, I use um, tungsten. Thank you very much. Thank you for calling, Anne-Marie. Next, we'll take a question from one of our students here in the studio. Would you give us your name, please? Leonardo Ross is my name. And, your and the question is, in your book, um, Dwayne Duck, you have, a, <laughs> you have um, two photo stories that you make, um, Falling Angel and Christ in New York. And right. I've read in the book that you're not very, re relig you're very religious, but you're not really Catholic anymore or in Christianity. Mm -hmm. And I was pondering about if it's a pun on Christianity or is it you're trying to share your ideas of what Christ was or how you see Christ in oh. the modern world. You mean Christ in New York? Exactly. Well, and Fallen Angel. Yeah, well, the Fallen Angel, they're about two different things. Fallen Angel is something which I call a revocable act, where something happens to a person and then the person is completely changed. Uh, I'm very much interested in religion, although I'm not a religious person. I'm a spiritual person. I never to confuse the two of those. Christ in New York is based, it's a political piece. It hits all the, all the, all the no-nos in today's culture. It talks about um, gun control, it talks about abortion, it talks about phony religious ministers, uh, and I've been proven right there. Uh, so I, I'm addressing all those issues which people don't normally talk about. 
I think everything's su subject for photography, especially religion. Um, I don't like organized religions, but I'm very much interested in God. And then the second part to the mm -hmm. question is that by doing this type of work, like the one you have in Dwayne Duck, you ex expose yourself a lot as a person and as an artist. You're giving all these very interesting insights. Um, yeah. How don't you feel like insecure, or do you feel threatened by that people are to completely reading what you think, or is that what you want to do and you're very yes, comfortable with it? No, no, and yes. <laughs> uh, no, actually, actually, I'm very secure. <laughs> Listen, it takes a lot of nerve to get up and do what I do. I'm doing shtick. Actually, the subtitle was called Dwayne du Duck Quack Photographer, but I never went so far as the subtitle. But uh, I'm very much, the only thing I know for two, uh, with any reality is my own feelings. So I, what I have to really do is talk about that truth. But I feel very secure in what I'm doing in an insecure way because it's, um, it's much easier to talk about somebody else's life and about their foolishness. You don't take any risks, but when you talk about your own foolishness, your own lives, you're taking a lot of risks. But I couldn't do that if I weren't secure enough to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll take a telephone call from Chris Ballantyne here in Rochester, New York. Chris, you're on the air. Hello, I'm voicing for Chris Ballantyne. I'm curious what your suggestions would be for a hearing impaired student working in the photographic area in the hearing world. Well, it's interesting because I write with photographs all the time. I think that hearing impaired students could extend their feelings if they have some problem. Well, well, if they could write, I mean, they can extend their expression. I don't know what problems they'd probably encounter uh, in terms of working with, with people because of the impairment. I don't think it should be really a problem at all because uh, photography is a silent medium by its very nature. And so I think they would be, maybe in directing things would be a problem, but they would be on par with any person who could speak, or could hear rather, excuse me. Does that answer your question, Chris? Not really. <laughs> yes, but he has another question also. Yeah. Could you put yourself in my shoes as a hearing impaired person, what would you do? Well, I would just try, to, it's hard for me to do that, but I would just try to function uh, with a camera like anybody else would. Uh, I think people are very sympathetic and if it does, if, well, it depends on what you're shooting. If you're shooting on the street, it, it might be dangerous because you could get hit by something. I, you have to describe the specific situation. It's hard for me to answer that. Thank you very much for your call, Chris. Now we'll go to Michael Angelo Lavera from Daytona Beach, Florida. Good Michael? Afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi. Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Michael Angelo Lavera. I'm calling from the Southeastern Center of Photographic Studies. And I'm calling on behalf of Martha Card's photo class and the whole entire school and staff. Um, I'd like to ask you one question. Which photographer or photographers inspire your work and why? Well, my favorite photographer is Robert Frank. I think Robert Frank is an absolutely incredible photographer. And I'm, there are a lot of photographers I like. I've not been, I think the, the only photographer who I ever took from, and I believe me, I think it's fine to take from anybody. Uh, yeah. But I, is Ache. I love Ache. And I did a project on New York years ago inspired by Ache, which was to, to, transitional for me. Uh, but I think Robert Frank is my absolute favorite. I also like Thomas Eakins a lot. I think Thomas Eakins is a wonderful photographer. Take a look at his photographs if you're not at all familiar with them. Great. Thank you very much. Sure. Have a good afternoon. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Michael. Our next caller is uh, Linda Snock from Sewell, New Jersey. Linda, you're on the air. Yes, hello. Uh, one second. Okay. Could you explain the creative process of your images are they conscious, meaning that they're intellectually contrived, or do you find they flow from the subconscious spontaneously? I believe in the intuition. I trust the intuition. I'm very right-brained, or not left-brained, and um, I just pay attention to what comes to my head. I've also, over the years, I've discovered that I'm very introspective, but I've been able to take all of those questions I ask myself and, and turn them into film, something I can actually look at. I think what you have to do is just begin to trust your intuition. You're not taught to do that, really. But that's the best part of you. And your intuition is that little voice in the back of your head that says, uh, how about doing this? And then you say, I couldn't possibly do that. Do it anyway. You get used to it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. Our next caller is Bill Faust from Charlottesville, Virginia. Hello. Bill, can you hear us? Yes, I'm here. Oh, hi, hi Dwayne. I'm sorry, I was talking to somebody else. <laughs> what, I was, what I wanted to ask you is, what happened to Margaret? 
Oh, Margaret, well, she never did come back. As a matter of fact, that little girl in Margaret Finds a Box grew up, and she was in a class someplace, and they showed this sequence, and she told the teacher that she was actually Margaret, and uh, <laughs> the teacher wouldn't believe her. <laughs> and uh, Anyway, it was just, it's not very interesting, actually. <laughs> no, but I don't know where she is. In fact, you know what she is doing, actually? Margaret is, she's become a professional groupie, and she follows some rock group, and I don't know which one it is around the country, uh, and that's what she does. All right. Don't I do really that. appreciate you. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bill, thank you very much for joining us today on the Techniques of the Masters. Our next call is Brian Shaley from Ogden, Utah. Brian, you're on the air. Hi, Dwayne. Are you from Weber? Yes, Weber State College. Right. Hi, Dwayne. I was just there. Yes, I know. <laughs> I saw you. And you're still talking to me? <laughs> you <betcha. laughs> Okay, I have, to, I have two questions for you, Dwayne. Okay. Um, what are your feelings uh, about commercial and photojournalism as opposed to fine art? Oh, I think they're terrific. I do both of them. Very commercial. Um, uh, photography is like playing the piano, and sometimes you play Kitten on the Keys, and some play, sometimes you play Mozart. The great joy of it is that it has all these possibilities. Whichever category you choose to be, the, be the best in it. Uh, my commercial work is always challenging to me because it's, it's like I've never done it before, and, but don't tell anybody. And, um, the commercial, uh, that side of my work, the commercial work, pays for the luxury of doing my private work. I, I, I have no problems with it at all. I, I, when I see a wonderful photograph in the New Yorker magazine or in any magazine of a champagne bottle flying through the air and flowers and done, all done with a big camera, I think, my God, how do you do that? I have great respect for that in a different way than I might have respect for some other photographer who does fine art work. I'm not a photo snob at all. Okay. Now, my other question. Um, when you were here at Weber State, you showed um, an Ansel Adams with a painting of a pear. And I painted on? Yes, exactly. Right. I want to know why. Why? why? Well, I did. It's the only one I had. Uh, I mean, if I had more of them, I would have painted on more of them. No, uh, that, uh, once you establish the principle that you can paint on photographs, then why not paint on somebody else's? Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know, it seemed the thing to do at the moment. I still like the idea. Uh -huh. <laughs> and you should do anything you want to do. Want to paint on one of my photographs? Buy uh -huh. it, don't steal it. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> okay. No, but do anything you want to do, just don't hurt anybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you for joining us today, you bet. Brian. Next, we'll take a, call, a question from one of our uh, students here in the audience. Would you give us your name and your question, please? Yeah, my name is Allison Walker, and I'm from Syracuse University mm -hmm. School of Visual and Performing Arts. And um, I was just wondering if you would share with us an interesting story about something that's occurred on one of your photo shoots. Well, this is sort of interesting. I was photographing, I had a job for um, Glamour Magazine, and uh, in the process of doing it's not that interesting, actually, but in the process of doing this job, uh, I had to have my assistant climb through the window. Um, oh, oh, it was about the apartment being robbed. It was illustrating a story about having your apartment being robbed. So I had the guy climb through the window, taking a, a, ca a TV camera uh, set out the window, and, but, and a little old lady saw him coming out the window and um, asked him if she could help him carry it out. But that's not the interesting part. The interesting part is when he got home, he had been robbed uh, <laughs> while he was being photographed, being, well, yeah, uh, that's not that interesting, but it's, uh, it just came to mind, yeah. There must be more, yeah. Thank you very much. Next, we'll take another one of our telephone calls from Daryl Lipnitz from Lafayette, Indiana. Daryl? Yes. Um, I've got a question about uh, the nature of photography. You've talked a lot about uh, people, taking pictures of people, but how do you feel about nature? Oh, I love nature. I'm all natural, uh, <laughs> except for this makeup. But uh, no, I, I I live in a country, and I and I have a big garden, and, and um, I don't eat M McDonald's or anything. I mean, I'm all you know. I drink water, the whole thing. Uh, I don't take. I do take. I've been taking more na uh, nature photographs. But as much as I like Elliot Porter, uh, I don't do that kind of work. What I I see the forest as backdrop for Midsummer's Night's Dream. I see the forest as a place of creepy crawly things and and moss growing up your leg, and like Walt Disney, all those trees going like this at night. I love the idea of, yeah, I love nature. Okay. Nature loves me. I've got one more question for you, too. Um, how long do you spend before you actually take a picture? Well, it depends on the photograph. Uh, with me, it's always the idea, and I have to think about it, and some ideas. If I get excited about something on Monday, I'll have it done by Friday. Right. Uh, so it depends on the idea. Sometimes I have to turn the gas down very low 
and let it simmer for a couple of weeks, maybe. Okay. Well, everybody from Jeff says hi, and my teacher says you're her hero. So thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for calling in, Daryl. Next, we'll take a call from uh, Mary Smith in Alta Loma, California. Mary, you're on the line. Yes, my question would be, how would one learn to let go of particular in, um, inhibitions or uh, being in a stereotype situation? Are there exercises or something that you can do to get out of this? Uh, you go like this for an hour every day. <laughs> no, actually, there aren't any exercises. But I think once you realize there's a problem, uh, then you can begin to work on it. Uh, um, doctor, I mean, uh, you should call my brother, he's a psychiatrist. No, uh, <laughs> what, I think, <laughs> what I think you should do is um, try to be as true as you are to what your natural feelings are. And if you begin, the Chinese say to walk around the world, you have to take a first step. If just identify one feeling and let go of it, and then it becomes easier the more often you do it. I don't okay. know how to answer you that. All right, question. thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mary. Next, our call is from Irene Russell in Monter Montclair, California. Irene, you're on the air. Hi. Um, my question is, is that when you're just beginning ph um, photography and you're taking pictures and you have so many high expectations and you're discouraged, what can you do to keep yourself to keep trying? Drink a lot. <laughs> no. no, everybody gets discouraged <laughs> and everybody has failed expectations. but. Um, you know, it's very hard in the beginning because you don't have a track record. You don't have any history. It's much easier as time goes on. When I did my first sequences, you know, people didn't know what the hell I was doing, neither did I. But it became easier in time. Um, you just have to learn how to develop self-confidence and just keep working. Just keep working. Don't quit. If you quit, you'll, the buck starts here. It doesn't end here. And you just have to keep working. That's all. Oh, okay. Great. Thank Do you it. Lot. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Irene. Next, our caller is Brian Neely from Tallahassee, Florida. Come in, Brian. Hi, how are you? Uh, my question is uh, for Mr. Michaels. Uh, you seem to be really concerned with the philosophical aspects of the student's work. How do you feel that you can get the philosophical message uh, across in your work? Well, again, I keep going back, I keep hitting the same note on the piano, but the idea is really to come to your own truth. But as students, you're too young. I mean, it's, I mean, it's just, you're too... It's not enough time, you have to have more history. But what you have to do is begin to ask questions. Mm -hmm. Ask questions of church, ask questions of the government, ask questions of church, uh, anybody who's in authority, ask questions. And don't stop asking questions. That's why these creeps take over the country because nobody asks questions. They let them do anything they want. And you have a right to ask questions. Even silly questions, any kind of question. Get in the habit of, of asking questions. You'll never get any answers unless you don't ask. Okay. All right, thanks a lot, I appreciate it. Okay. All right, bye-bye. Thanks so much for joining us today, Brian. Our next caller is David Richardson from Abington, Virginia. David, please give us your question for Duane. Uh, Duane, one of the questions I'd like to ask is pertaining to the films and paper you use and uh, how that pertains to your creativity. It doesn't. Uh, my creativity is, and the film and paper, uh, I don't print, I haven't printed in 20 years. Um, that's why my hair fell out. <laughs> Too much time in the dark room all alone with a little bottle. But uh, uh, what was that? I, you know what it was? I used to have sips of sherry. And then one day somebody came in and caught me sipping and uh, I got a terrible reputation for it. No, it's not the paper. It's, um, I don't care about the paper. I have a great printer. I have Igor, who is the world's greatest printer. Uh, don't ask. Anyway, uh, <laughs> if you have great ideas and you have great photographs, a bad idea is not going to be proved by great paper always a great idea. I'd rather see a terrible print of a brilliant idea than a gorgeous, perfectly printed bad idea. So go for the idea. The paper, that takes care of itself. That's like asking Hemingway, what kind of typewriter or paper do you use? Forget about the paper. Get the idea first. Is that an answer? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, David. Now, our next caller is Charles Jones from Houston, Texas. Charles, come in, please. Yes, how are you doing? Good. I'd like to ask Dwayne, what is his favorite photograph that he's taken, and could you give us the background on it? Well, it's hard to say what your favorite picture is. Uh, I have so many brilliant, brilliant ones, it's, it's, it's impossible. To, <laughs> my favorite, though, I always like the Magritte picture, because Rene, the portrait of René Magritte with the double easel, because Magritte was so wonderful, so kind to me, and uh, his ideas opened my mind, and René, wherever you are, thanks. No, René Magritte, that's my favorite portrait, and among the sequences, there are so many I like. I suppose things are queer is a real
crowd pleaser, and it works very well. Those are kind of my favorites. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Charles. Our next caller is Judith Purcell from Odessa, Texas. Judith, are you there? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Okay. Let's have your question for Doreen, please. Uh, yes, hi. I was wondering what Mr. Michaels uh, thought we might be able to do about the current funding controversy with the National Endowment for the Arts. Mm -hmm. I heard this morning that they rescinded a $10,000 grant mm -hmm. because of controversial images yeah. in a show in New York. Well, first of all, uh, I think what you really have to do is do whatever you need to do. Uh, artists should never, never be ever uh, uh, censored, especially by somebody jerky in government. I mean, the people in government, the worst. I mean, the first thing any fascist does is try to stop free expression. So what you have to do is do what you need to do. If it doesn't matter, it's nearly not a matter of the grants. I mean, grants are only 20 years old. If you're a real artist, you do the work whether you have grants or not. Uh, the only thing you can do as a citizen is complain to your congressman. And I sent a telegram to uh, George Bush, but uh, he hasn't answered me yet about it. <laughs> but um, keep doing the work and don't care what anybody says about it. I mean, you have to go where your own truth is. As, um, uh, oh, oh, the guy on Bill Moyers, I can't remember his name now, he said, follow your bliss. And, um, and stay out of the way of Jesse Helms. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> the voters down there will get rid of the bum, huh? <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for your call, Judith. Our next caller is Eric Freeland from here in Rochester, New York. Eric, you have a question for Dwayne? Uh, yes, I do, but um, the man's name you're looking for is Joseph Campbell. <laughs> Joseph Campbell, right, yeah. yeah. Give this guy a prize. <laughs> <laughs> I would just like to know, um, what have been your major influences outside of photography, say in literature or philosophy? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, there have been a lot of influences. My, my favorite guy, I think, is Walt Whitman. When I, when I was 15, I, no, 17, I bought my first Walt Whitman book, Leaves of Grass, and I never got over it. I still go back to it. And, I've, and then there have been a number of people. Uh, certain Cavafy was a wonderful, the Greek poet was wonderful for me. And Magritte was great, and, and De Chirico was great, and, uh, and uh, da 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 da, like that. Yeah. How do you think those have affected your photography? They all opened my mind, mm -hmm. because my mind is more mental than visual, I suppose, in a way. I mean, my photographs. Uh, and they freed me. Anybody who frees you, anybody who permits you to be who you are, or could be who you could be, anybody who encourages you. And these people, they redefined me. They redefined my possibilities. And once they opened the door for me, I, I went through the door. People can open the door, but you have to go through the door yourself. Okay. And th those are my favorites. Mm. Thank you very much. Sure. Bye. -bye. Thank you for calling in, Eric. Our next caller is John McBride from Erdenheim, Pennsylvania. Did I say that right, John? Yes, sir. Thank you. You where's, have a question for Dwayne? Where's I, er, I have a question for John. Where's Erdenheim? It's a suburb of Philadelphia. Oh, okay. Just out of Philadelphia. Mr. Michaels, it's certainly a pleasure to have you participate in this teleconference. My question for you today would be, which do you feel is more challenging uh, to produce, the single concept photograph or the photo series? And forgive me if I don't get uh, the names right, but the deer hunter, track whip, sir, murder in the classroom? Okay. Uh, well, first of all, each problem has its own solution. Some ideas are much more complicated than others. Um, I think you have to depend. It's hard to say which is harder to produce. It's simply a matter of uh, the idea. And if an idea is really complicated and needs props or something, then that's harder to do. Uh, did you want me to answer those specific sequences or stories? Well, I, I prefer the series. I think that. Mm -hmm. uh, the storytelling and the sequence—it's uh, more fulfilling. Uh. Well, it gives you a greater vocabulary rather than have being, you know, it's wonderful if you could do it in one photograph, and I, I think that's terrific. But if you, uh, it gives you a greater chance to express things because you have a, a moment of time in time to express it. it. Also, gives you a greater chance to fail because your story could be lousy, and you could be even worse photographer. So there are risks involved in any creative uh, act. I appreciate you for your time. My pleasure. Thank you for calling in, John. Our next caller is Olga George from Wichita Falls, Texas. How's the weather there, uh, Olga? I'm going to Texas tomorrow, so I wonder whether I need to pack a raincoat or not. Oh, it's, it's clear. It's very clear here. That's great. You have a question for uh, Duane? Yes. Um, in the classroom lecture that he gave earlier, I'm curious about what he meant when he said to take it further in reference to the photograph that was mainly detail, form, and shape. 
It was a photo that was taken mm-hmm. in the evening. Mm-hmm. And does he mean to like have people in it, or in what direction does he yeah. do you mean to take it further? Sure, uh, people. Let me explain. I did a project on New York where I photographed everything empty, and they look very much like the shots, that, that kind of a shot of a t- particular place. And I could have stopped right at that point, too, and been very satisfied to reproduce a street scene or the facade of a building or electric lights of some sort. But there was this thing operating where I began to see all those places as kind of backdrops, like stage sets. I took it further by wanting to people those stage sets and making something happen. And, and that freed me. So when I say take it further, I mean, don't stop there because it looks nice and it looks like what you saw. Ask yourself, now what happened? What happened on that street? And then go reinvent the street scene. Think of it as backdrop, not a, an end in itself. Okay. You should always take things further. Don't settle for the first, don't be trapped into that kind of instant gratification. You know, get a, be a, start scratching, whatever that means. <laughs> I'd like to say that Midwestern State University photography class is interested and um, would like to know more about this. Well, uh, we'll talk to you afterwards, maybe. <laughs> Thank you so very don't much. Call for, collect. Thank you very much, uh, Olga, for your question. Why don't you call me at my office sometime and maybe we can help you out, okay? Uh, our last call for the day is going to be Philip Milio from New York City. Philip, are you on the line? Yes, I'm on the line. Okay, uh, Philip, give us your question for Duane. Sure, hi, uh, thank you. I'm calling from the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City. And I'm wondering, uh, uh, Duane, do you have an art or an art and design background? And what, what actually got you into photography? Uh, well, that's a very long story. Uh, I, when I was always interested in art, when I was high school, I used to draw and enter the scholastic contest. I was very competitive. And then I didn't do that for long. I always had an aesthetic itch. I, again, I didn't know where to scratch. Uh, I got, became a photographer by accident at 28. It presented itself, and it's what I should be doing, and uh, the rest is history. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Philip, and thanks to all of our callers for joining us on the Techniques of the Masters video conference. We hope you enjoy this program. We appreciate your comments, so uh, please give us your comments and suggestions on your cards that you sent them in to us. I want to thank uh, Dwayne for being with us today. We really made it special for all of us. We really enjoyed it. And I want to thank Alice Beckodet and the students at the School of Visual Arts. And I want to thank the students from Syracuse University for being here today, too, helping us out. Debbie, you want to wrap it up for us? Delightful time with Duane. Thank, thank you both you. very much. This brings us to the end of another show. We've really enjoyed having you with us. Be sure and get your cards in for posters and set your plans to join us next February 15th for Andreas Hyman and Arnold Newman. I'd like to thank Bill Green, James Enyart, and Duane Michaels for taking the time to be with us here today. Thank you to our students from Syracuse, both as audience and as phone operators. And a special thanks to you, our audience, for your participation, support, and company. It's been a great show. On behalf of Ken Lassiter, Mike Garn, and myself, good day from Rochester.